in the arid lands where the whispers of ancient prophets still echo through the windswept deserts and time-worn stones, a tumultuous tapestry of conflict has been woven, thread by bloody thread. Welcome to the embattled realms of Israel, a land revered as hallowed ground by billions, yet also a tumultuous theatre of ceaseless strife and heart-wrenching warfare. From the gritty struggles of the 1947 to 1949 Palestine War, ensnaring figures like David Ben-Gurion and King Abdullah I, to the formidable shadows cast by the titans of conflict such as Gamal Abdel Nasser during the fraught days of the Six-Day War in 1967. Can you hear the cannons roar across the Sinai Peninsula? Can you feel the shifting sands under the weight of armoured divisions clashing in the sweltering heat? In Israel, in order to be a realist, you must believe in miracles, said David Ben-Gurion. A saying that ripples through the tumultuous tides of Israel's conflicted history, mirroring the incessant quest for peace amid a symphony of swords and sorrows. Absorbing the powerful words of Mahatma Gandhi, an eye for an eye only ends up making the whole world blind. How do these echoes of non-violence ripple through the tumultuous oceans of historical clashes and contentions? Join us as we traverse the chronicles of Israel's battle-scarred past, navigating through the haze of warfare and the echoes of tumultuous conflicts to unveil the human stories shrouded beneath the shadows of swords and the tempests of history. Welcome to the Diary of Julius Caesar. The Echoes of Balfour, the legacy of a century-old promise in modern conflicts. In the crucible of World War I, a potent proclamation emerged that would resonate through the corridors of history, leaving an indelible imprint on the tapestry of Middle Eastern geopolitics, the Balfour Declaration. Crafted on November 2, 1917, by Arthur James Balfour, the British Foreign Secretary, this cryptic yet momentous document articulated the British government's support for establishing a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine. The historical theatre was set against the backdrop of the Ottoman Empire's declining prowess and the strategic calculus of British imperial interests intertwining the threads of diplomacy, war and Zionist aspirations. Navigating through the complexities of the Declaration reveals a convergence of motivations. Britain, engaged in the labyrinth of global conflict, sought to secure wartime alliances and post-war spheres of influence, leveraging the Declaration as a strategic chess piece. In this geopolitical chessboard, prominent personalities were instrumental. Chaim Weizmann, a notable Zionist leader and chemist, cultivated significant influence within British political echelons, contributing a nuanced dynamism to the evolution of the Declaration. Numbers and statistics unveil the demographical transformation that Palestine underwent. In the embryonic stages of the Balfour Declaration in 1917, Jewish inhabitants constituted about 10% of Palestine's population. Fast forwarding through the corridors of time by the onset of World War II, Jewish inhabitants had burgeoned to approximately 30%, reflecting the tangible impacts of the migration currents facilitated by the Declaration. An intricate mosaic of international agreements and promises characterized this epoch. The Sykes-Picot Agreement of 1916, a secret arrangement between Britain and France, carved spheres of influence in the Middle East, sowing the seeds of conflicting promises with the Arab custodians of the land. These interwoven pledges cultivated an environment ripe for future contentions and contestations. Diving into the depths of historical nuances uncovers curious intersections of the Declaration's impacts. The Arab inhabitants, the historical custodians of the Palestinian lands, found themselves ensnared in a tumultuous tide of changing demographics, political promises and the oscillations of British imperial strategies. Their voices reverberate through history echoing sentiments of a profound sense of betrayal and disillusionment as their demographic majority and historical claims became subsumed under the currents of the unfolding Zionist project. Quoting the text of the Balfour Declaration itself illuminates the essence of its articulated commitments. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors 
to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine. The Crucible of Cataclysm, Chronicles of Independence and Nakba, 1947 to 1949. In the intricate tapestry of Middle Eastern history, the years 1947 to 1949 stand prominently as a period marked by dramatic transformations, bearing the imprints of national creation and calamitous human dislocation. The conclusion of the British Mandate in Palestine paved the path for the realization of the Zionist vision of a Jewish homeland, as encapsulated in the United Nations General Assembly Resolution 181. Adopted on November 29, 1947, this resolution echoed the international endorsement of the partition of Palestine into Jewish and Arab states. The announcement reverberated across the global stage, galvanizing diverse reactions and setting the stage for an impending conflict. The emergence of Israel on May 14, 1948, marked a monumental juncture, heralding the birth of a nation amidst a turbulent milieu of opposition and contestation. David Ben-Gurion, embodying the aspirations of the Zionist movement, proclaimed the establishment of the State of Israel, an act that ignited the flames of conflict with the neighboring Arab states. A coalition of Arab armies from Egypt, Syria, Transjordan, Iraq and Lebanon marched towards the nascent Jewish state, heralding the commencement of a fierce struggle known as the War of Independence in Israeli narratives. Parallel to the currents of conflict ran the tragic streams of human suffering and dislocation, referred to as the Nakba, or catastrophe, in Palestinian parlance. This period was characterized by a significant exodus of the Palestinian Arab population, with estimates ranging from 700,000 to 750,000 individuals. Villages were abandoned and historic communities disrupted, weaving a tale of loss and displacement that resonates with profound reverberations in Palestinian historical and collective memory. Navigating through the contours of the conflict unveils various strategic locales that were central to the unfolding battles. Jerusalem, an epicenter of religious and national significance, emerged as a fiercely contested city, witnessing the siege of its Jewish quarter and subsequent division. Key battles, such as those at Latrun and the corridors to Jerusalem, highlighted the strategic military maneuvers, showcasing the intensity of the struggle over pivotal territories. The anecdotes of this period are punctuated with tales of diplomatic endeavors and individual experiences. From the corridors of the United Nations where diplomatic battles were fought to the fields and alleys where individuals faced the stark realities of war and displacement, a multitude of stories emerged. Notable figures such as Count Volker Bernadotte, a UN mediator, played crucial roles in the conflict's historical narrative, embodying the complexities and challenges of peace efforts during tumultuous times. The armistice agreements of 1949 delineated the boundaries that emerged from the ashes of battle, carving a map marked by armistice lines rather than internationally recognized borders. These lines, tinged with the imprints of conflict, encapsulated the territorial gains and losses that defined the geopolitical realities in the aftermath of the struggle. In the realms of numbers and statistics, the war echoed with the harsh tones of loss and suffering. Israeli casualties numbered around 6,000, a significant toll for a burgeoning nation. The Arab losses, too, bore the weight of the conflict's intensities, contributing to the broader landscape of sorrow and sacrifice. Sands of Conflict, the unfolding tapestry of the 1956 Suez Crisis. In a tumultuous cascade of geopolitical dominoes in 1956, the Suez Canal, the sinew of maritime commerce and strategic military navigation, became the epicenter of an intense crisis that unveiled the shifting paradigms of post-war global politics. On July 26, Egypt's fiery and ambitious leader, Gamal Abdel Nasser, nationalized the Suez Canal, a move that reverberated across the power corridors of London and Paris, shaking the foundations of Western economic and strategic interests in the Middle East. The canal, an artificial waterway slicing through Egypt's arid landscapes, 
was the conduit through which passed two-thirds of Europe's oil supply. In the covert shadows of diplomacy, an infamous collusion was carved out between Israel, the United Kingdom and France. The objective was lucid, yet woven with layers of complexities. A tripartite military intervention aimed at reclaiming the canal and overthrowing Nasser. Israel, motivated by securing navigation through the Straits of Tehran and subduing the mounting ferocity of Fedayeen attacks, launched an invasion into the Sinai Peninsula on October 29th. Britain and France, masquerading their actions under the guise of safeguarding international maritime passage and preventing hostilities between Egypt and Israel, initiated a series of aerial and seaborne attacks. Operation Musketeer, the codename under which the British and French operations unfurled, brought into play a powerful array of warships and aircraft, displaying the robust military machinations that the Western powers possessed. By November 6th, a ceasefire was coerced onto the belligerents by mounting international pressure, chiefly orchestrated by the United States and the Soviet Union. The Cold War giants, although ideologically discordant, echoed unified sentiments of opposition against the tripartite invasion. An intriguing tableau of international responses emerged in the wake of the crisis. President Dwight D. Eisenhower, driven by a nuanced amalgam of Cold War considerations and the doctrine of promoting peace and stability, was vociferous in his denunciation of the tripartite aggression, leveraging economic and diplomatic arsenal to usher a cessation of hostilities. The United Nations, too, played a pivotal role, deploying the first-ever peacekeeping force, the United Nations Emergency Force, UNEF, exemplifying an innovative framework in conflict resolution and peacekeeping paradigms. Amidst the ricocheting tremors of the conflict, facts and figures painted a stark portrait of the historical episode. The death toll reverberated with the echoes of lost lives, witnessing the demise of approximately 1,650 Egyptians 231 Israelis and 450 British and French troops. Economically, the canal remained closed until March 1957, ensnaring global maritime commerce in a web of uncertainty and disruption. A curated mosaic of anecdotes also embellishes the historical narrative of the Suez Crisis. One such narrative echoes with the British Prime Minister Sir Anthony Eden's misconception of Nasser as a dictator comparing him with the vehemently notorious figures of Mussolini and Hitler. Such misconceptions reverberated through the chambers of decision-making, influencing the dynamics of the British involvement. Lightning over the Levant, the reshaping of the Middle East in the Six-Day War of 1967. In the simmering summer of 1967, the Middle East became the crucible for a transformative conflict that recalibrated the region's geopolitical landscape the Six-Day War. A swift and decisive conflagration, the war was ignited by a confluence of territorial disputes, political brinkmanship and military miscalculations. Tensions escalated precipitously with Egypt's president, Gamal Abdel Nasser's dramatic moves, notably the expulsion of the UN peacekeeping forces from the Sinai and the closure of the Straits of Tehran to Israeli shipping. These actions, fanned by the winds of Arab nationalism, and fraught international diplomacy, set the stage for the tumultuous events that followed. On June 5, 1967, Israel, perceiving an imminent existential threat, launched a preemptive airstrike, decimating the Egyptian Air Force. This opening salvo reverberated with astonishing impact, shaping the trajectory of the conflict. The Israeli Defense Forces, IDF, under the strategic command of generals such as Moshe Dayan and Yitzhak Rabin, executed a multi-front campaign against Egypt, Jordan and Syria. Jerusalem, an emblematic city embroidered with religious and historical significance, became a fierce battleground, culminating in the city's unification under Israeli control. Mapping the six tumultuous days of conflict reveals a landscape marked by pivotal battles and territorial shifts. The Sinai Peninsula, Golan Heights, West Bank and Gaza Strip emerged from the crucible of war as territories under Israeli administration, dramatically altering the geographical and political equations of the region. The war's statistics sketch its staggering scope and scale. Israel's casualties 
numbered around 776, while the Arab states suffered a far heavier toll, with estimates soaring to 18,000. Delving into the historical granularities uncovers moments and maneuvers that punctuated the conflict. Notable operations, such as the Battle of Ammunition Hill and the encirclement of the old city of Jerusalem, became etched in the annals of military history. Quotes from the war's protagonists echo with the intensities and emotions of the era. We have returned to the holiest of our holy places, declared Moshe Dayan upon reaching the Western Wall, encapsulating the sentiment of historical and religious resonance experienced by many Israelis. Yet, within the shadows of victory, lingered the contours of human tragedies and complex consequences. The war gave rise to an intricate mosaic of military occupation, political dilemmas, and humanitarian considerations. A significant Palestinian population came under Israeli administration, inaugurating an era marked by challenges of governance, resistance, and the pursuit of peace and security. Curiosities also shimmer in the war's historical tapestry. Operation Mokad, Israel's initial airstrike, stands as a testament to the elements of surprise and meticulous planning, reflecting a remarkable fusion of intelligence and military execution. The war also witnessed an intriguing episode involving the USS Liberty, an American naval vessel inadvertently attacked by Israeli forces, a tragic event shrouded in mystery and controversy. The Silent Siege, Chronicles of the War of Attrition, 1967 to 1970. In the aftermath of the Six-Day War's rapid tumult, the Middle East found itself ensnared in a grinding and grueling conflict known as the War of Attrition, 1967 to 1970. This shadowy war, less heralded than its precursors and successors, carved its niche in the annals of military history as a protracted struggle, primarily along the windswept stretches of the Suez Canal. The war's landscape was punctuated by fortified positions, artillery duels, and the harrowing echoes of aerial bombardments. The strategic calculus of Egypt under President Gamal Abdel Nasser sought to bleed the Israeli military through sustained low-intensity operations, aiming to recalibrate the balance of power and reclaim territories lost during the preceding conflict. Nasser's resolve was mirrored by an equally unyielding Israeli leadership, determined to maintain its territorial holdings and deter future hostilities. The theatre of the Suez Canal was marked by immense military fortifications, aptly named the Barlev Line by the Israelis, turning the area into a fortified bastion symbolizing the broader contest of wills and military strategies. These ramparts became the focal points of numerous assaults, ambushes and counterattacks, underpinning the essence of the attritional conflict. Numbers narrate a tale of the war's cost. Thousands of lives were extinguished in the heat of battle. The Egyptian toll is estimated to range from 2,000 to 10,000, while Israel suffered approximately 1,424 fatalities. The material costs too were staggering, with the widespread deployment of artillery, tanks and aircraft, resulting in substantial losses and degradations of military assets. Peering into the war's minutiae unveils the role of major historical figures like Hafez al-Assad of Syria, whose military also engaged Israel in repeated skirmishes on the Golan Front. Significant, too, were international actors, such as the United States and the Soviet Union, whose diplomatic and military roles cast influential shadows over the unfolding events. Curiosities dot this historical landscape. The usage of the Soviet-supplied Assam missile batteries by the Egyptian forces was a novel feature of the conflict, enhancing their defensive capabilities. Similarly intriguing was the Israeli innovation in response constructing a makeshift navy on the canal using modified civilian boats, which came to be known as the Zippo fleet due to their vulnerability to fire. Historical quotes encapsulate the era's ethos, such as Nasser's words, what was taken by force can only be restored by force, reflecting a pervasive sentiment driving the conflict's persistency. Anecdotes from the ground level further humanize the conflict's narrative, recounting tales of soldiers enduring harsh desert conditions, sustained danger, and the psychological strains of ceaseless hostilities. A rich tapestry of military operations delineates the war's narrative, 
including notable Israeli operations such as Raviv and Priha, aimed at dismantling Egyptian fortifications and asserting military dominance. The infusion of aerial warfare, marked by the intense participation of the Israeli Air Force, added a formidable dimension to the military strategies and confrontations. Thunder in October, unpacking the Yom Kippur War's echoes of surprise and struggle. October 1973 witnessed the storm clouds of war once again descend upon the Middle East, as Egypt and Syria unleashed a coordinated and surprise offensive against Israel on Yom Kippur, the holiest day in the Jewish calendar. The desert sands along the Suez Canal and the rugged terrain of the Golan Heights became epicenters of intense and grueling military confrontations. A renewed sense of Arab nationalism and the quest to reclaim lost territories propelled the military strategies of Egyptian President Anwar Sadat and Syrian President Hafez al-Assad. The surprise was both strategic and psychological. The Egyptian and Syrian forces made initial gains. Egypt managed to cross the Suez Canal and establish bridgeheads, while Syria exerted immense pressure on the Golan Heights. Names like the Valley of Tears and the Chinese Farm became synonymous with the fierce battles that marked the relentless push and pull of the conflict. Dates etched into the conflict's timeline, like October 6th when the war began, and October 25th, when the UN brokered ceasefire was mostly in effect, delineate the urgency and rapidity of the diplomatic and military machinations. The data speaks to the fierceness of the conflict. Israel suffered about 2,800 fatalities, and Arab casualties were considerably higher, with estimates varying. Historical personages like Golda Meir, Israel's Prime Minister, and US Secretary of State Henry Kissinger played instrumental roles in navigating the tumultuous tides of war and diplomacy. Kissinger's shuttle diplomacy and America's resupply of Israeli forces were pivotal in shaping the conflict's trajectory. Amidst the war's stark realities, shimmer curiosities and anecdotes. For instance, the codename Operation Bada, chosen by Egypt, encapsulated a historical and religious symbolism, echoing an ancient Islamic military victory. Stories of individual valor, like that of the Israeli tank commander Zvika Greengold, who, against overwhelming odds, held off Syrian forces in the Golan Heights, add layers of human resolve and resilience to the historical narrative. In this cauldron of conflict, the superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union, maneuvered their influence, casting a Cold War shadow over the regional conflagration. Their roles were instrumental in the arms supplies and the eventual ceasefire, evidencing the broader geopolitical ramifications of the conflict. A saga of military strategies and technological evolution also unveiled itself during the war. The effective use of anti-tank and anti-aircraft missiles by the Egyptian and Syrian forces, like the Saga missiles, presented substantial challenges to the Israeli military. Israel's innovative usage of electronic countermeasures and the adaptation of battlefield tactics underscored the dynamic evolution of military doctrines. Quotes from the era encapsulate the climate of surprise, struggle and reflection. We were caught unprepared, admitted Israeli General Haim Bar-Lev, encapsulating the initial Israeli response, while Anwar Sadat's proclamation, We have crossed the canal, reverberated with historical redemption. Operation Entebbe, a symphony of valor in Uganda's theater. In the ominous shadows of 1976, a theater of audacity, valor and precision unfolded at Uganda's Entebbe airport, echoing across the annals of military and hostage rescue operations. This saga, known as Operation Ontebe, or Operation Thunderbolt, commenced with the ominous hijacking of an Air France Airbus A300, carrying 248 passengers by two members of the Popular Front for the liberation of Palestine, external operations, and two members of the German revolutionary cells. The flight, en route from Tel Aviv to Paris, was diverted to Antebbe, and the passengers were held in the old terminal of the airport, facing the terrifying uncertainty of a hostage ordeal. Names such as Jonathan Netanyahu, the older brother of Benjamin Netanyahu, who subsequently became Israel's longest-serving prime minister, are etched into the operation's history. 
Yonatan, the operation's leader, played a crucial role, embodying the mission's courageous spirit but tragically lost his life during the rescue. Chronicles from the mission's timeline are gripping. June 27th marked the beginning of the ordeal, with the hijacking's execution. Fast forward to July 4th, and a canvas of meticulous military artistry was painted as Israeli commandos stormed the airport, rescuing 102 hostages in a mission that lasted 90 minutes. Operation Entebbe showcased a tapestry woven with extraordinary military planning, intelligence and execution, turning it into a legendary military operation studied and admired across the world. The mission's framework was laced with numerous fascinating elements and anecdotes. For instance, the involvement of Ugandan dictator Idi Amin, who was initially portrayed as a mediator, but later revealed complicity with the hijackers, added a layer of political intrigue. Curiosities also loom around the old terminal where hostages were held. It was under a renovation funded by Israel before becoming the stage for this historical drama. Strategies and tactics illustrated the depth of operational planning and adaptation. Modified Hercules C-130 transport planes flew over 2,500 miles for the mission, a testament to their logistical orchestration. A black Mercedes, resembling Amin's car, was used as a deceptive tactic to initially confuse the Ugandan forces, exemplifying the mission's detailed intricacies. Historical quotes illuminate the operation's atmospherics. We are coming home, transmitted the rescue team, embodying a message of hope, assurance and national solidarity. Numbers further articulate the mission's tale. Three hostages lost their lives and 102 were rescued, while all the hijackers and 45 Ugandan soldiers were killed. In this historical orchestra, the international community played its part, with the mission being conducted amidst a backdrop of negotiations involving various nations and international entities. Paris, where the ill-fated flight was originally headed, became a hub of diplomatic activities, and the unfolding events held the global audience in a suspense-filled grip. Lebanon, 1982, echoes from the battlegrounds of invasion and siege. The labyrinth of Lebanon's streets and the echoes of the Mediterranean witnessed the tempests of conflict in 1982. The tapestry of this war was woven with complexities, strategic calculations, the shadows of historical antagonisms and the visceral impacts of siege and combat. On June 6, 1982, Israel launched Operation Peace for Galilee, marking the beginning of an invasion that would reverberate through the realms of military history, geopolitical shifts and human suffering. The architects and executors of the invasion were faces marked by historical significance. Menachem Begin, the Israeli Prime Minister, and Ariel Sharon, the Defence Minister, are etched into the narrative, embodying the tactical and political realms of the operation. Their intent was clear, to expel the PLO, Palestine Liberation Organization, led by Yasser Arafat from Lebanon, extinguish the threats festering in Israel's northern perimeters, and alter the geopolitical architecture of Lebanon. Navigating through the war's timeline unveils various military and strategic strokes. A rapid Israeli advance through southern Lebanon characterized the initial stages of the operation, with the city of Sidon falling under the military spotlight. In the subsequent chapter, the Lebanese capital, Beirut, was encircled, heralding a siege marked by bombardment, endurance, and international pleas and negotiations. Historical quotes from the era resonate with the war's grim and robust undertones. We will hit them hard, declared Ariel Sharon, encapsulating a sense of military resolve. Conversely, the international community's expressions mirrored concerns and appeals for peace, a dialogue reflecting the global responses to the unfolding theatre of war. The data and numbers from the conflict narrate their own tales of sorrow and strategy. Civilian casualties marked the tragic imprints of the conflict, with the Sabra and Shatila massacre echoing as a dark chapter in the annals of war crimes, leaving hundreds, if not thousands, perished. The metrics of military engagement were also formidable, with extensive troops, artillery and air power engaged in the choreography of conflict. Curiosities and peculiarities linger amidst the war's shadows. Anecdotes 
such as the alleged use of a donkey by the Israeli forces to trigger landmines, provide glimpses into the war's brutal inventiveness and the extents of human and animal involvement in the throes of conflict. The war's broader consequences unfolded in realms political and human. The exit of the PLO from Lebanon marked a significant shift in the landscape of Middle Eastern conflicts. The Israeli military, despite tactical and technological prowess, found itself navigating the intricacies and challenges of urban warfare and the complexities of achieving broader political objectives. Places that bore the war's impacts, such as Beirut, narrate tales of resilience and rebuilding, but also the enduring scars of conflict. The war also heralded shifts in alliances and the geopolitical contours of the region, with Syria, a crucial actor in the Lebanese canvas, navigating its own strategies and implications in the conflicts unfolding. Unveiling the First Intifada Rebellion, Response and Political Reshaping The First Intifada erupted in December 1987, casting long shadows on the Palestinian territories and Israel for about six years. Initiated largely as a non-violent popular uprising, it later evolved into a more coordinated and militarized movement, signifying the profound frustrations and aspirations of the Palestinian people living under Israeli occupation. The Intifada was a culmination of long-standing grievances, aggravated by immediate triggers like the fatal traffic accident involving an Israeli and several Palestinians at the Jabalia refugee camp. The grassroots nature of the uprising was exemplified by the involvement of various segments of Palestinian society, from women and workers to students and local community organizations. Significant Palestinian figures and groups such as Yasser Arafat's Palestine Liberation Organization, PLO, and Hamas, an Islamist organization that gained prominence during this period, played crucial roles in the uprising. Hamas's influence during the Intifada marked a substantial shift in the Palestinian political landscape, providing an Islamist counterweight to the secular PLO. Israel's response to the Intifada was multifaceted and substantial. A strategic doctrine labelled as the Iron Fist policy was applied, involving curfews, mass arrests and house demolitions. Prominent political and militant figures were expelled and thousands of Palestinians were detained. Around 1,100 Palestinians were killed and countless others were injured or imprisoned over the years of the uprising. This intifada saw a wide range of protests, including civil disobedience, boycotts and widespread strikes. Demonstrators faced the Israeli military with stones and Molotov cocktails and the scenes of stone-throwing Palestinian youth became iconic representations of the uprising. The streets of the Gaza Strip and West Bank were often engulfed in the chaos of tear gas, rubber bullets and live ammunition. Notable incidents like the killing of Mohammed al-Dura, a 12-year-old boy shot during a Gaza Strip protest, highlighted the tragic human toll and generated international sympathy and outrage. Such incidents also exacerbated the harsh realities of the conflict, contributing to its escalation and the hardening of positions on both sides. Anecdotal records and quotes from the period vividly illustrate the sentiments. For instance, the then Israeli Defense Minister Yitzhak Rabin, famously and controversially, urged his troops to break the bones of the Palestinian protesters. Such directives underscored the severity of the Israeli military response and contributed to the enduring legacy of bitterness and trauma. The Intifada did not occur in isolation, but was influenced and molded by international reactions. Global opinion largely swayed towards sympathy for the Palestinian cause, exerting pressure on Israel and catalyzing diplomatic engagements. The United States, although traditionally an Israeli ally, facilitated dialogues and negotiations, marking active international mediation efforts in the conflict. Substantial shifts in strategies and approaches were witnessed during the Intifada. The Israeli government, initially rigid, gradually opened to negotiations resulting in the Madrid Conference in 1991 and later the Oslo Accords. The Intifada also catalyzed an internal Palestinian debate, leading to a nuanced approach toward the concept of a two-state solution, marking a pivotal adjustment in the political aspirations of the Palestinian leadership. 
navigating peace, the odyssey of the Oslo Accords. In the labyrinth of Middle Eastern diplomacy, the 1990s were marked by a hopeful yet tumultuous quest for peace between Israelis and Palestinians, culminating in the Oslo Accords. This period bore witness to unprecedented maneuvers towards reconciliation, underscored by both the fragility of hope and the formidable shadows of historical animosities. The architectonics of the Oslo Accords were designed in secrecy, navigating the turbulent currents of skepticism and hostility, with Norwegian facilitation playing a pivotal role in bridging the chasm of mistrust between the two factions. Anchored in 1993, the initial chapters of the Oslo Accords unfolded on the lawns of the White House, where the symbolic handshake between Yitzhak Rabin, the Israeli Prime Minister, and Yasser Arafat, the PLO Chairman, heralded the dawn of a new era. This spectacle of hope was infused with practical modalities aimed at facilitating a phased progression towards a comprehensive peace, pivoting on mutual recognition and the prospect of Palestinian self-governance in specific territories. Key architects like Shimon Peres, Mahmoud Abbas and foreign ministers such as Johann Jorgen Holst brought to the negotiation tables their visions, commitments and the onerous responsibility of navigating the mazes of compromise and contention. Throughout the process, intricate details, ranging from security cooperation to economic collaborations, were meticulously deliberated, embedding the framework with complexities and aspirations reflective of the broader spectrum of peacebuilding. The interim governance arrangements emerged as a significant component of the Accords, envisioning the establishment of the Palestinian Authority and delineating the jurisdictions and phases of Israeli withdrawal from the Gaza Strip and parts of the West Bank. While such developments signalled unprecedented milestones, they were concurrently punctuated by contentious issues such as the status of Jerusalem and the question of refugees, which remained formidable challenges shrouded in the uncertainties of future negotiations. Statistical landscapes also unfurled their narratives. For instance, subsequent to the Accords, the 1990s witnessed an escalation in Israeli settlements, with the settler population in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, growing substantially. This demographic and geographic matrix further complicated the evolving tapestry of peace and territorial negotiations. The pathways of the Oslo Accords were not linear, but marked by the ebbs and flows of intermittent crises, political transitions and acts of violence. Noteworthy incidents, such as the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin in 1995, reverberated with profound impacts, shaking the foundations of the peace process and reflecting the intense polarizations and contestations ingrained within the socio-political realms. Quotations from the era encapsulate the myriad sentiments and philosophies influencing the trajectory of the peace process. Rabin's words, you don't make peace with friends, you make it with very unsavory enemies, echoed the pragmatic and contentious dimensions of the peace odyssey. Likewise, diverse voices, ranging from skepticism to optimism, resonated across the global arenas, reflecting the multifaceted perceptions and stakes intertwined with the Oslo process. Unraveling the Second Intifada, a tapestry of turmoil. In the chronicles of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the years 2000 to 2005 stand as a testament to a period drenched in blood and turmoil, etching the saga of the Second Intifada into the indelible pages of history. The inception of this violent uprising was a confluence of simmering frustrations and immediate flashpoints, with Ariel Sharon's contentious visit to the Temple Mount, or Haram al-Sharif, lighting the fuse of the already volatile landscape. Diverse in its mechanisms and ferocious in its manifestations, the Second Intifada painted the regions with strokes of bombings, military operations, and an ongoing theatre of death and retaliation. The Intifada bore witness to the anguished cries at checkpoints, the raging bulldozers, the construction of separation barriers, and the enigmatic Arafat encapsulated within the besieged compounds of Ramallah. Streets, cafes, and buses transformed into arenas of unpredictability and fear as tragic events orchestrated mainly by factions like Hamas and the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade wrought havoc, claiming lives and sowing seeds of perennial traumas. 
statistical echoes resonate with the grim tales of loss, with over a thousand Israelis and several thousand Palestinians meeting death's embrace during this turbulent epoch. Cities like Jerusalem and Tel Aviv became the epicenters of chaos and despair, as the dark clouds of bombings loomed ominously, striking at the cords of daily life and social fabric. In the realm of leadership and political architectures, figures like Ariel Sharon and Yasser Arafat maneuvered through the tumultuous terrains, their actions and decisions intricately intertwined with the unfolding tapestry of the uprising. Arafat, often ensconced within the realms of Ramallah, emerged as a symbol of Palestinian resilience and ambiguity, his legacy and strategies subject to the lenses of scrutiny, reverence and controversy. The global gazes were also cast upon the evolving scenarios, international reactions mingling in the realms of diplomacy and mediation. However, the corridors of peace seemed increasingly elusive, the Oslo Accords promises drowning in the tides of bloodshed, distrust and despair. Prominent interventions, like the Quartet's Roadmap for Peace, attempted to resurrect the diminishing flames of reconciliation, but the shadows of reality proved ominously overwhelming. Historical quotes from this era emanate the spectra of emotion and philosophy. Sharon's depiction of Arafat as an enemy who decided to make a strategy of terror reverberates with the polarization and animosities characteristic of the period. Contrasting landscapes were also portrayed through dialogues and discourses, reflecting the myriad narratives and paradigms coursing through the realms of conflict and diplomacy. Echoes of the 2006 skies, the canvas of conflict and change in Lebanon. In the blistering heat of July 2006, the winds carried whispers of war through the landscapes of Lebanon and Israel. A turbulence named the Second Lebanon War unrolled its fierce scrolls, writing the chapters of a 34-day conflict that transformed the textures of the regional tapestry. The duel's dramatis personae prominently featured Hezbollah and Israel, with each maneuvering the military chessboard with strategies that strove to script success in their sagas. The ink of causality paints the origins of the conflict with strokes of contention and confrontation. A day in mid-July marked the prologue, where Hezbollah militants crossed into Israel, stirring the sands with abductions. These acts of aggression filled the skies with the wings of war, as Israel responded with the thunder of airstrikes and the deluge of a ground offensive aimed at purging the strongholds of Hezbollah. Names and places emerged as crucial coordinates in the cartography of the conflict. Key figures such as Ehud Olmert and Hassan Nasrallah wielded the wands of decision and direction. The terrains of southern Lebanon and northern Israel narrate tales of battles and bombardments, where towns like Bint Jubail and cities like Haifa were caught in the crossfires of calamity. The strategies unfurled by each side display a panorama of military minds at work. Israel's might manifested through comprehensive airstrikes, naval blockades and ground incursions. Their objectives radiated aims to retrieve the abducted, dismantle the architecture of Hezbollah's militancy and dilute the showers of rockets reaching Israeli realms. Hezbollah, on the contrary, orchestrated the orchestra of its operations with asymmetrical tunes, harmonizing rocket attacks with guerrilla tactics. Their rockets, manifesting as significant symbols of their strategic score, reached beyond the borders, bearing the ballads of reach and resilience. Statistics, the numerals of the narrative, sketched the scales of loss and the ledgers of damage. The conflict concluded, leaving over a thousand Lebanese and about 160 Israelis enshrouded in the shrouds of mortality. Infrastructural veins were severed and the body of the economy bled losses embroidered in the fabrics of billions. In the aftermath's embrace, the pages turned to reveal the contours of change and consequence. The UN's hands penned the resolutions that sought to script peace and promise recovery. Troops from international territories trod the soils, weaving the presence of peacekeeping into the post-war patterns. Historical quotes emanate from the lips of leaders and the texts of agreements, echoing the rhetorics of resolution and retrospection. Expressions of victory and vows of continuous resistance breathed life into the political landscapes, 
molding the mines and maps in the shadows of the war's sunset. Curiosities also color the canvas of this conflict's chronicle. Tales tell of the river Litani's paths, witnessing the waters of warfare and the olive groves grasping the gusts of conflict and survival. The echoes of the 2006 skies reverberate through the realms of history, resounding with the resonances of strategies sculpted, lives lived and lost, and the lingering legacies in the landscapes of Lebanon and Israel. Roads to Resolution Navigating peaceful avenues in the Israeli-Palestinian tapestry. Navigating the pathways of the Israeli-Palestinian conundrum requires traversing historical boulevards and contemporary avenues, where the echoes of diverse narratives reverberate. Since 1947, with United Nations Partition Plan in Resolution 181 proposing the creation of independent Jewish and Arab states, the seeds of the two-state solution were sown. Leaders like David Ben-Gurion and King Abdullah I of Jordan were pivotal figures of that epoch, embodying national aspirations and the complexities of acceptance and rejection. In the tapestry of time, Oslo in 1993 emerged as a significant landmark, where Yitzhak Rabin and Yasser Arafat's historic handshake under the watchful eyes of President Bill Clinton symbolized a momentary blossom of peace. Oslo cultivated frameworks of mutual recognition and potential statehood, with cities like Jericho and Gaza shimmering as early harvests of Palestinian self-governance. Yet, the Garden of Peace is often shadowed by the clouds of contention and violence. Notable occurrences, such as the assassination of Rabin in 1995 and the tumultuous cascades of the Second Intifada, exemplify the fragilities and storms that have swept the landscapes of resolution. An alternative route through the one-state discourse envisions integrated highways of Israeli and Palestinian citizenship. Intellectuals such as Edward Said have contributed to this dialogue, nurturing debates around democracy, identity, and the confluences of two peoples in a single territorial and political ensemble. Economic architectures also emboss their signatures upon the peace map. The Paris Protocol of 1994, for instance, sketched economic relations between Israel and the Palestinian Authority, cultivating terrains of customs unions and fiscal cooperation. However, economic disparities and restrictions like the blockades on Gaza often cast shadows of limitation and challenge upon these terrains. Cultural and educational bridges offer realms of connectivity and understanding. Initiatives such as Seeds of Peace or the bilingual schools operated by Yad Biyad, hand in hand, unveil spaces where Israeli and Palestinian youths navigate the rivers of dialogue, empathy and shared learning. Historical voices also resonate with the colors of inspiration and caution. Consider Ehud Olmert's 2008 peace proposal and Mahmoud Abbas's reflections on missed opportunities, embodying tales of negotiation and the intricacies of agreement and hesitation. As the canvas of history unfolds, it vividly paints the turbulent tales of Israel's past, a symphony of survival scrawled across the sands of time. From the shadows of 1948, where the melodies of independence and the tumult of the Nakba danced, to the recent echoes of conflict that reverberate through Gaza's grieving grounds, warriors and leaders like David Ben-Gurion and Yasser Arafat have carved their chapters, etching the edges of epochs with decisions and destinies. In the words of Mahatma Gandhi, there is no way to peace, there is only peace. This quote resonates as a reminder, a reverberation through the corridors of conflict, encouraging hearts to harbor hope, to cultivate the gardens of peace amidst the battlegrounds of adversity. So as the curtains close on our narrative journey, may the stories serve as steadfast sentinels, guiding towards a horizon where peace prevails and the olive branches of harmony flourish amidst the ancient lands of promise.